a lot of good information. Um, I might go fast at times just to kind of keep keep on moving. Um, but basically, the it's an update on our brook trout efforts down in the southeast, uh, the history of of where things have been. Um, yep. The, the genetics work we've done, um, the management for our heritage populations, and then our stocking plans for our new uh, strain of brook trout. Oh boy. So a little bit about me. I grew up um, in Oakdale and I grew up fishing lakes and uh, had a cabin up north um, near Cromwell and realized I love anything to do with water and fishing. I attended the University of St. Thomas for my undergrad, NDSU for master's. You guys... Okay, you can see this. Okay, so here's a picture of what I used to get to do when I first started with the DNR is electrofishing. Caught some really nice trout. I know where all of them are. And then I transitioned um, for about six years into a project management role where I was working um, on quite a few trout unlimited projects down in the southeast and I was um, you know the DNR liaison I guess for those projects coordinating with TU and landowners and the construction crew and the engineers and so I learned a lot about um, those habitat projects in that role and now I'm back to handling fish so I've been in this new role for two years now. That goes way fast. Okay, so brief history of the hatchery brook trout in Southeast Minnesota. Prior to 1993, uh, the brook trout in the Minnesota hatcheries from our, were from Eastern strains. Um, early 1990s, Minnesota DNR creates a new strain from two streams that we thought were native populations, um, but there really wasn't documented stocking history. And this new strain was called Minnesota wild. Uh, the Minnesota wild was first stocked in 1995, and it was used exclusively in Southeast until 2016. It was a very successful strain that we still have numerous self-sustaining populations today. But in 2016, Crystal Springs got a disease and they had to be depopulated, and that was the end of the Minnesota wild strain. During this same time frame, um, in 2007 to 2009, our research group uh, was starting to look at our brook trout distribution in our streams in Southeast Minnesota. And specifically, they were having them tested for genetics. And so they did these presence absence surveys where they went out and shocked. They basically went out and shocked any stream where they think brook trout might be. And they tested 174 streams and they found 118 of those had brook trout. Again, we were kind of specifically targeting those streams. And then they genetically analyzed 74. And I'll get into this, what this more means. This is a really ugly genetic tree cluster that probably nobody is gonna care about, except for what we found, this big yellow area. Basically they compared all the samples to known stock genetic fish that we still have in hatcheries. This big yellow area is all the streams that were related to the stocked populations. This little green area that I don't have highlighted, those are the Minnesota wild strain stock streams. These other gray areas, and they, they branch out separately. You can see that they're very unique from this big yellow area. These are what we're going to call the three genetic clusters of heritage brook trout. So brook trout are the only native trout species in southeast Minnesota. Browns came from Germany, rainbows came from West Coast. So all we've had historically is brook trout. And the big question was, do we have brook trout that have been here forever? And we do. You know, the, the different populations, whether there's drift, um, is up for discussion. So here's the map of what that looks like for the Southeast. The green dots are where I have heritage populations, which is really exciting. Look at them all. The yellow is where they related to the Minnesota wild stock strain. The red is where we have this eastern strain that was stocked. And the gray is um, like there wasn't enough to test uh, area. So again, here's a Minnesota wild strain. 
Unfortunately, when they created this strain, they thought they had two um, heritage populations, and it turns out they did not. So here's Springbrook over in the not heritage, but we did have Coolridge um, was one of them. So they got half right. So there's this new quest to create a new brook trout strain from these heritage populations. So prior to depopulation, this was already kind of being discussed. And they started disease testing potential donor streams in 2009, but they really ramped it up in 2015 when they lost the Minnesota wild out of the Crystal Springs hatchery. And the reason for the disease testing is if we're going to bring wild gametes or any material into a um, hatchery, they can't be, they can't have disease. So they need to be disease free for three years in a row. Um, the donor streams needed a large population of adults because we actually do the egg takes in the wild and bring again the um, fertilized eggs. We do it in the field and then bring those into the hatchery. And so far we've had two streams that have been used for the collection and the new term for this new strain is going to be called Minnesota Driftless. Very cool. So the heritage brook trout genetics currently are made up of Middle Creek, which is again, we have these three genetic watersheds we're calling them. So Middle Creek typed out as the Zumbro watershed and East Indian actually typed out in the Rush Creek watershed, which is down here. Weird. Why? Well, um, there is historic records showing that they wild transferred um, adults from Cool Ridge. Nope, sorry, Hemingway, Hemingway to East Indian. So that's how they're related there. Uh, we have this last population down by us that I will get to, but we do not have those genetics in this strain currently. So the, the egg takes laborious, but Quick summary, they've done it from East Indian twice and Middle Creek twice. And our plans are to do one of the South Fork watersheds this fall. Quick, dirty details of the hatchery. Um, they have, these are actual fish. We have stocked, um, some of the brood stock are ready in a stream somewhere near Lanesboro. Um, but the the plan is that these will then be stocked as fingerling size, 250 fish to the pound this July, August. So this is innovative stuff that's happening right now. So that's kind of why I wanted to come here today to share this with you. So in my role, you know, we have these, we had a great idea to create this new strain and we get these fish going in the, the hatcheries and they're, you need to request them two years out because they need to raise them and take care of them until they're aged to be able to stock. But a lot of what my role now is like managing and a lot goes into management. And so this is kind of a summary of some of the like ideas of like, how do we decide where we put these and what other management can we do with the actual heritage streams that we have? So that's kind of the next segment. So for future management, you know, we'll go to this Clean Water to Land and Legacy Amendment, which is protection enhan enhancement and restoration. So for protection, you know, we can do land acquisition. Fisheries doesn't do a lot, but a lot of times we'll select a, a land and then like a, we'll turn it into WMA. But we do um, do a lot of acquisition of easements for folks like you to be able to fish our streams. Enhancement, you guys are very involved with habitat improvement. Um, another portion of enhancement is stocking this Minnesota driftless strain of, of fish where they might have been once extirpated. Restoration, um, again, can include that stocking and then as well as stream and watershed restoration. So I'm going to go through some examples um, of those things. So land acquisition, here we have a heritage brook trout stream. You can see all these green dots. This is the South Fork area. We have Vesta Maple, Girl Scout. Camp Creek, this is labeled wrong. Um, but so we have land acquisition. So here's some WMAs that have been purchased by the Nature Conservancy. And uh, here's an example of easement acquisition. So this is Vesta Creek. There's a WMA on the lower reach, which is not the greatest for trout population, connects to the South Fork. 
we are collecting our fish up in this reach. And ideally we have, we, we would have, um, uh, luckily we have a nice lander that's willing for us to go there and collect um, creek or uh, fish to have tested. But if we had easement access, it would allow us to get to there for management purposes. Um, Again, we're, that's where Vesta is located here. So our goal of the Lanesboro office is to get one of those South Fork streams into the mix. It's better to have um, a holistic mix as far as the genetics go so we don't get bottleneck. Here's another example where easement acquisition can allow us to um, have better opportunities for habitat improvement project. This is Nepstead Creek, which also has the heritage brook trout in it. And you can see here, these yellow squares are parcels that we are trying to acquire easements from. And so we have easements where the yellow squares aren't, but there is a lot of gaps. A lot of this is state land, um, but there's quite a few gaps and especially access from any roads that allow us to have access for you guys and justify doing a habitat project. Here's another case, Maple Creek. Uh, the, another heritage brook trout population, there is a WMA down here, but really the brook trout water gets better the further upstream you get. So we're focusing our efforts um, now in this stream and similar streams where we know that we have heritage brook trout to try to increase opportunities for people to be able to fish those. And so here's the um, enhanced improvement project we do have plans with T to the WMA reach which we're actually ready to decide how we can design a project specifically for brook trout it's something we haven't really done we've kind of tried um, there's a couple of folks in Wisconsin that have been doing it so we actually have those folks joining us next Friday to try to design it make sure we're not building something where browns are just going to want to move into that reach. Here's a picture of what that reach looks like. Um, braided channels, issues with aggradation that you have either this braided channel or this cobble being built up, obvious stream bank erosion, bank sloughing. This the pattern actually changed in 1964 and so I I hope the plans are going to be to put it back into that more meandering pattern as there's a few evidence of where it was cut off and then it starts a head cut, which causes the bank height to grow and these short, steep riffles that aren't really great for trout spawning. Another picture there. So again, here's the kind of the fish summary you can see here. This was back in 2009, the most recent data we have, but here's that upstream reach where we do not have an easement. 270 brook trout were collected, 204. Um, there were quite a few collected down on the WMA and it gets lower as it gets to the South Fork. Again, this is the reach we will be targeting. There was some smaller bank work done down on the, the lower end to help out a landowner. But phase one would be in the WMA and phase two would be down in the um, lower easement area and then the upper reach would require easement. So getting into the stocking again we can use this as an enhancement or restoration. We can stock fish every year if we wanted to just to keep brook trout there for people to catch but we could also restore them into streams where we think maybe they once were and that might not always have um, access but it's something that we could do to try to get these heritage brook trout reestablished as our Water quality has really gotten better over the years. Land use practices have helped some. So. so some of the stocking approaches for our drift, our Minnesota driftless brook trout. Um, some of the things we have to think about are stream connectivity. So, you know, do we stock direct trips of the Mississippi? Um, or do we stock maybe entire watersheds and find watersheds that don't have any heritage brook trout? go recon and look for all the little tribs and cold water sort we could stock them. You know, the answer, do we stock places where you guys have access to, or are we going to try to put them in the tributaries that, you know, where we think they'd be successful, but maybe people can't access currently. And then 
you know, we have different brook trout population scenarios that we have to also look into. So we have ones that have heritage um, brook trout already. We have the Minnesota wild. We have the eastern uh, um, hatchery um, that have none. I'm just going to kind of go with some of those examples because it's easier to see visually. Um, so these are some examples of, you know, stocking direct tribs, the Mississippi. And the easy ones to cross off are going to be these ones that have the green heritage populations. We That was the easy one. That we're not going to stock uh, a hatchery, ray fish, no matter what, on top of uh, what we believe is to be the native brook trout populations. But we could target some of these other ones, whether they have where we stock, where we put Minnesota wild before. Um, here's an example, Cedar Valley Creek that has no brook trout. And we have another example here, Pleasant Valley Creek that has the eastern strain. So we could stock on top of that and see how they did compared to the ones that are currently there. Another idea I have is taking like a watershed stocking approach. Here's the Garvin Brook, Stockton Valley, Pearson watershed that has either no brook trout um, that we know of or has the eastern strain. And so we could go into that entire watershed and try to repopulate the areas that um, would support brook trout with the new strain. Here's a side-by-side -side scenario of, you know, public access versus potential success. The stream here, daily creeks, um, easement throughout the entire reach. See this stream over here, these are all these light blue dots are all springs. So you could see that that's going to have significantly more cold water just by looking at this map, because not all the springs are mapped, but another kind of question we have to answer. And then the example of the four different stream types to stock, we have no brook trout, we have the Minnesota wild, the hatchery, and then the heritage. And again, the heritage populations not planning to stock on top of. So this is what we're left after we removed all those green dots. Still quite a few options. Once you get into each of those examples, and there's also a range of abundance, what's already currently there. So you could have a brook trout um, population that you previously stocked with Minnesota wild. There's big adults everywhere. They're reproducing like crazy. Does it really make sense to go in there and try to enhance that population? Um, another example is you might have ones that have meant from when they were last stocked, but they're obviously not reproducing. We have the scenario where you have the, the eastern strain and they're doing okay. You know, they're trying to hang on there, but maybe if we stocked the new strain, they would end up being more successful than what previously stocked. And then the no brook trout scenario, um, we have to also then decide and determine, are they not there because the temperature is not right? Are they not there because the habitat's terrible? And maybe they were just once extirpated and we put them back and they do just fine. So here's our plans, um, just a, a summary of them and where our brains kind of went. Um, our plans for stocking, which again, this proposal was created in 2021 because we had the plan two years ahead of time. Our plan is where we previously had put some of the Minnesota wild and where it was planned for 2014 to 16, because again, we got cut short when they depopulated that population. We're also planning to stock some new introduction streams for restoration and then stock on top of the Eastern strain. And we're actually developing a um, research project right now that we will actually test after stocking to then see once they start reproducing what genetics basically win out, you know, are the brook trout that we stock gonna do better than what's already there. And then we've decided that we're not stocking any streams with thriving populations. Um, and most of the ones we've ruled out were that Minnesota wild strain we'd stocked and also streams with the heritage strain or streams that we find are limiting. So here's our list. I'll just, oh, there it went. <laughs> oh, we took a picture quick. No, go ahead. Um, this is our list. And, you know, you can look at the streams. We're stacking these as fingerlings, but 
the kind of interest. So we have some of the Minnesota wild streams we're stocking. We have some of the Eastern hatchery, and these will be the ones that we're gonna target for our research project, East Beaver and Bee. Um, and then we have ones that don't have any brook trout. Um, so we kind of as the rear introductions, um, new stocking, uh, but there's present new stocking, no brook trout present. And then we have some streams that they, they did this for the Minnesota wild too. And at the time it just was an easy way to put in for more fish. So we have kind of these maintenance stockings. So here's what the map, and it was kind of interesting that just based on trying to prioritize things, we had a big, huge spreadsheet. We had to make the decision in like two weeks. It was the biggest decision I made when I first started. And um, a month in, I'm deciding where we're going to be stocking in this new strain of brook trout. Um, it was pretty neat that it, like geographically, it's actually very, I feel like spread out. It's a little heavy in the Winona area, but um, you can see we had to like avoid, you know, the South Fork root area, um, kind of focused more on some of these direct tribs because that's a little easier to, less likely to screw up, I guess. Um, So if you have any information, please hit me up. Uh, so again, these here's our kind of plans in summary. Um, prior, so we made these decisions in 2021. Our plan was last summer to do recon of the streams that were on our list because that list has already changed. We had some streams on there. We went shocking and there was like brook trout everywhere. Like, yeah, I won't name names, but no, yeah, uh, Pine New. Hartford and so those ones are doing just fine and we're not going to stock them at this time. Uh, we also put in a ton of temp loggers so all these places it's like can they support brook trout we basically put in a summer temp logger for three months and put it on a graph where we know they can thrive and not be stressed and all of those cases um, it came back fine so we didn't drop any of like the ones where there was no brook trout. And then this year I ran into another hiccup, which I didn't even know existed. Um, we cannot, Peterson hatchery is where these fish are and it is currently a class B hatchery. We cannot stock class B fish into either a class A stream. So you can't make the stream worse by adding these fish. They're not disease, they have a pathogen with the possibility of disease. Um, but most of them we don't know, and they've only typically in the, historically if they've been classified B if they've been stocked with class B fish before. <laughs> so what it's led to us to have to do is review all of our historic um, stocking records to determine um, if we can change some of our classifications. But we do have a lot of class B streams and only a few that we have to determine if we can actually stock into. But again, just another hiccup in working for the state government. Um, so our plan is to stock these streams uh, for three consecutive years, again, starting in July and August, and then we will reevaluate the stocking in 2008 or 2028 and 2029, um, just to see how they're doing. We can reevaluate whether we want to continue but my, my overall plan is that we would stock this group of streams for three years, go to another group of streams for three years, go to another group of streams for three years, and that 2028, 2029, by then we can still have time to propose two years in advance to go back to any of these A streams if we need to. Hoping, you know, that three years will be enough to get a population going. So here's kind of the 2022 stream recon we did. Uh, basically just shocking. We're not really collecting anything, just looking. Do we have different age class of the brook trout? And this was on Pine Newt Hartford again. And we found that we did. So we took this one off the list. Um, no stocking, plenty of fish, browns, brooks, biomass galore. Just did a habitat project there. So must be that. Um, another example, Lynch Creek, um, it has current brook trout, it was last, um, 
shocked in 2017. Went back in there. There were some adults, no recruits, no young of year. It had previously been stocked with Minnesota Wild, um, but obviously they're struggling for reproduction. So our plan is to stock there. And again, these are just some of the examples of these kind of decisions we had to make with the data we collected this year. Here's an example of the um, stream recon we did with water temperature, Cedar Valley Creek. This did not have any brook trout. Um, we felt there was good habitat, and then we put a temp logger at the bridge. It's right where there's a tributary and the main channel. And so this is a graph showing if you're in the blue, you're in your range of growth for brook trout. Yellow is range of stress, and orange is um, lethal. So pass the test there. So we're going to proceed with stocking into that stream. And then this is just an example of the stream recon um, we have to do for disease classification. So this is Pleasant Valley Creek. It was last stocked in 1953, I believe. Um, our records only go back for disease testing to 1978, so we can't rule out um, or rule that, that it was a stocked with class B trout already. Um, it was not limiting. We took temperatures, so we basically have to go back in early this spring, collect brown trout to be disease test in the path lab, and then we'll, we'll test for that pathogen. Not sure what I was going to say there, but... Oh, so this is just kind of some, um, you know, future management ideas. So for heritage brook trout pot protection enhancement, um, you know, groups like yourself or other people that are advocating for monies, you know, targeting land and ease of acquisition for heritage brook trout or potential for Minnesota driftless um, introduction. And then we're going to, again, design habitat improvement projects focused specifically for brook trout. So more headwater streams, we've typically done more of the medium-sized waters, and we're doing a lot of overhead cover and things that are better for brown trout. Um, but we need to think, um, you know, what would, what would help enhance these brook trout populations and help those guys out a little as well. So that's coming. I can give a talk maybe a couple years on that. And then improve, you know, the watersheds with those heritage brook trout. I Again, we can enhance our current populations so we can increase fishing opportunities and reassured stocking that we're stocking these heritage genetics back into our watersheds. And again, we're going to restore brook trout populations where habitat and temperature are suitable. And if you have any ideas for any of this, please feel free to contact me. Um, because I'm always up for ideas out there fishing these streams, you know, learn a different side of the the streams than we. Well, that's it. No idea how fast they went. It was it? It was pretty, pretty good. So just so you guys know, Melissa is my new best friend, not your new best friend. She's my new best friend. <laughs> are we going to do uh, Zoom questions or are we going to do live questions first? So, okay. uh, uh, Paul, we do have one uh, uh, question in the Zoom and I expect more will, will come in. So why don't I ask the one question we have now on Zoom and then I'll turn it over to you and you can pass the mic around. Uh, so the Zoom question that we have is from Charlie Phelps, and he's asking, will the new heritage brook trout spawn with the eastern brookies and or do wild, Minnesota wild brookies uh, 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 spawn with the currently spawn with the eastern brookies? So I guess this question of cross spawning between the different strains of trout. My best guess is yes. Um... Obviously, it's something we don't know currently. The fact that we're stocking them as fingerlings, like sometimes we see they don't um, reproduce right away if they're maybe stocking as adults because they're shifted. The hatchery, they shift them a little bit, so they're a little earlier spawning. Um, but I would envision stocking these as fingerlings. I mean, literally, like the size of your pinky or smaller, you know, they'll naturalize to their surroundings and the natural cycle out in the wild and I would envision yes they would 
And that's, you know, when we stock on top of that Eastern strain, we chose that, you know, we could test the, them against the Minnesota wild as well. The issue there is that half the Minnesota wild population was created from heritage genetics. So it'd be really, it'd be harder to discern those going forward, which population was doing better. Eastern strain is a lot more different than um, the heritage strain. So when we do that research project, our plan is to let them do their thing for a while and then basically test, take fin clips from the new, you know, we'll stock for three years, wait for two, and then any little babies that come out, you know, we didn't stock them. So we could take fin clips from those, have them tested for genetics, and then they'll be able to see, do they cluster out closer to the Eastern strain or the heritage strain, or is it just a big jumbled mess? But it's pretty crazy what they can do, even testing how individuals are, they can, they could tell like who's who parent. So there's the option of that. I think the plan is to, to put some pit tags, which are little glass beads that have a code when you swipe a wand over, just like a barcode it'll read a serial number. So we inject these pit tags into individuals. So another plan is we can we can pit tag individuals. We can start tracking some of that parentage and lineage as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Brent Porter, which is, can you visually identify the different strains? No. Yeah, no. Um, I think we've even asked the hatchery folks, and maybe they could, not me. Um, but maybe, you know, I I think maybe once again, and I heard, you know, they, the fish grow and act and look differently when they're raised in the hatchery. The Peterson hatchery, they're like raised in domes. You know, they don't even have like natural light. And so... I think, again, if we did like a pit tag scenario where, or fin clip, you can, we could have the hatchery clip the adipose off of every one we stock. So later, four years after you stocked them, you'd know whether it was one you stocked or one that was just naturally already there. So these will be great questions in like four or five years. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So here's, write the, them here's, down. A, here's a... Yeah, uh, Melissa, here's a question from Mike Rebisky, which we don't have to wait four or five years, I don't think. And the question is, maybe I missed it, but why are you creating a new strain of brook trout? What's the what's the reason for doing it? We we had to depopulate our other strain. No, so we don't I have that, any in the hatchery yeah. currently. I think the question is, what is the benefit of having the Minnesota driftless strain? What are the benefits of those genetics? You got to wait four to five years. Honestly, we we could stock these in their total junk, you know, and I'll be like, what did we do? Um, I think from a, you know, a restoration standpoint, the, the good feelings of we're stocking heritage genetics versus brook trout that came from New Jersey or whatever, wherever the Eastern strain is from. Um, so I think the, you know, once the, the Crystal Springs would depopulate it, it was kind of an easy way to go that we should create a new strain, which they did with the Minnesota wild. But this time let's make sure, like, since we have the, this genetic data, let's make sure that their heritage brook trout and not this weird mix. Um, I don't know why you'd not do it. Okay. So not to put words in your mouth, but I, is the theory that, you know, these trout were adapted to the driftless environment for, you know, thousands of years or whatever, compared to Eastern trout, which are adapted to Eastern environments. So the theory is that maybe these will be really well adapted to our streams, but like you say, you have to try it for four or five years and see if that theory is really true. Yeah, I like that answer. That's what I was, that's what I was going to say. Or when I'm driving home, I'll be like, man, I wish I would have said that. <laughs> By the way, it feels like I'm like on a game show. Like there's this voice. 
<laughs> Sorry, I'll I wanna put. Win, I'll, I want to win a car. <laughs> uh, I I I I'll, uh, I I guess I'm in video. Uh, okay, so we have a couple more questions uh, on the Zoom. Uh, this is from Lee Stowe, and he's wondering if you're planning to lower the banks on Maple Creek below the WMA. Yes, eventually. Yep, that's uh, phase two. So below WMA, it goes to that pasture and it's really long reach um our we have our own habitat improvement crew in our office and they have expressed interest in doing that reach um they're pretty booked for the next couple of years so hopefully we'll do the one through the wma and then we'll continue on down to where it connects to the south fork it'll get tricky though because then you're really messing with do you what do you design for down there if you know do you really want to make sure there's no browns in the entire stream or do you, is there some weird transition area? But all of this work, we, number one priority is typically reduce stream bank erosion, which is lowering the banks, shaping them back. Um, what you do in stream, I think, is going to delegate whether you're managing more for the brook trout or brown trout. Okay, thank you. I have one other question on Zoom right now, and then maybe we should turn it over to the in-person audience for a while. But this question is from Craig, and he's just wondering whether you're seeing shifts in the percentages of rookie and brown populations in the southeast Minnesota driftless. And if so, do you have any theories about why those shifts are occurring? That's That is a good question. Um, I have heard from people fishing maple, uh, just using that one as an example, that they're catching a lot more brown trout through that WMA reach than they used to. Um, again, so that's another area we want to target for restoration and see if we can kind of flip it back to a preference by brook trout. Um, I would, I would think that you know, I'll just say this. In the last 10 years, our spring flow has increased significantly in in the southeast. I've been around, again, 15 years. There's dry runs that, that when I first moved here were dry, and now they're perennial stream flow. And we've heard this from other various hydrologists. Um, so our groundwater levels are, are high. Our springs are flowing good, um, which you think would be advantageous for the brook trout. Um, and we do see where we've had some brook trout populations in the past, they're definitely thriving pretty well as well. So we have numbers of reproduction in the last few years when we had, had very few floods. Um, 2021 was kind of verging on drought and we saw a really strong year and all those um, fish are turning into adults 2022 adults for some of our streams and so it'll be interesting to see if those then transition to greater than 12 greater than 14 inch so the the trout opportunities and the trout populations are and we've been saying this actually probably for the last five six years they're like at record highs right now you know this is like prime time get out and fish how the browns and the brooks are are it, there's a lot that goes into that. I'm not sure I can give a super educated answer because I don't have a ton of data, but I, I think it's good that we're starting to you know, focus more of our efforts on brook trout management. And that's kind of what this whole talk was about. There's more than just stocking them. You know, there's, there's land acquisition that we can do and even think about a habitat project. Um, and there's also work we can do with landowners for watershed management, because who knows where we'll be 20 years from now. Maybe we won't have the spring flow. I've, I've seen graphs that we're in a wet, wet cycle. So maybe ask me that question in like 20 years again. <laughs> okay, well, Melissa, uh, I think we should probably, uh, we do have a few more questions in the, in the chat. And I may get to those later, but maybe uh, you want to turn it over to the Fat Pants uh, in-person audience. And I apologize for this, but um, 
since we only have one microphone, you either need to have people raise their hand to ask questions and then you hand them the mic to ask their question or else you'll need to repeat their questions so we can hear you on Zoom. Hi, Melissa. Thanks for your time tonight. Uh, how did the Minnesota Heritage Train compare to the strain in Iowa that they're very hot and bothered about down there? That I do not know, but um, there might be an option to kind of see because, as you know, some of our streams go into Iowa, and Bee Creek's one of them, and we're planning to stock that. I'm not sure the brook trout would the brook trout water is definitely better north of the Iowa border. Um, I'm kind of all, you know, there's Iowa efforts. There's there's actually efforts going on in Wisconsin. I don't know if you guys attend the Driftless Symposium, but two years ago, uh, Wisconsin talked about some of their efforts and I immediately contacted them, you know, like what rates are you stocking at? You know, how did you to decide those things? There's like so much that goes into this. Like how, how do we know how many fish to ask for and what, and so it's kind of neat that all this is almost, I know Iowa has been doing it for a little while at the Pine Creek, um, but I'm not 100% sure. No, I shouldn't say that. They're on, it's on our, okay. Somebody else has a question while we're figuring this out. Uh, big fan of the work you're doing. Um, is there any plan to, if everything goes successful, again, not looking at a far, far in the future, hopefully, uh, would brook trout stocking occur outside of the driftless area or would this new strain be relatively constrained to the driftless region? I think there's like six or seven areas that I've already put in for, they'll be stocked in 2023. So to answer your question, no, it's not just um fish in the yeah there's Duluth's getting some um who else did they meet with I had to give a basically a summary of the whole disease classification thing because Duluth had four streams that were not class b so they didn't know they couldn't be stocking into them so we're all like scrambling to kind of figure out what we can actually do but I'm kind of leading a charge by default because I was the one that kind of figured it out the hard way um so yeah, good question. So statewide, these these trout can be requested from any area office. So again, reach out to your areas if there's other areas you like to dreams in, and they'll they'll tell you hopefully where they're gonna plan to put them. I think it's important that education of this new strain. So here's the Iowa ones. It's not like how do they compare, but these are they're related to the the South Fork root genetics, which makes sense. Right down there. Minnesota's have to be better, I'm sure. I don't know if you know this, but what are the brook trout on the North Shore? You know, what are their genetics? Are they a heritage brook trout? Are they an eastern brook trout? Do we know? I know they're different. And actually those are the ones that um, Crystal Springs has a different strain that is being used like in lakes for stocking. I forget the name of it though. Send me an email and I, I have my cards up there. My email is on the last thing. I will, anybody that thinks of a question tonight when they can't sleep because they're like, man, I learned so much today and I just can't stop thinking about it. Yeah. Two things. Uh, first of all, what's the budget for this project? How much money? Where is it coming from? Do you know the manager here? So most of our most of our hatcheries are funded, I believe, through trout stamp money, or maybe at least some of it. Um. I have no idea how to calculate how much has it been spent between our field staff time. I mean, you could kind of guess, but 
Um, there's been a lot that's gone into even all that genetics work to even figure out, yes, we do have heritage populations. Relatively, the field work to like collect the actual things, it's a day. So that's not really the big, um, it's probably more of the money spent in the hatchery, which they'd probably be able to figure out, but I'm not familiar with what they spend. Yeah. Secondly, and secondly, um, risk management after five years is really a waste of money. Management of whether or not a project works or not after five years is a waste of money. What do you well, you need to be able to risk manage a project before it gets to the point of waiting five years to find out whether a project works or not. Yeah, and this isn't the first rodeo. Brook Toad have been stocked going back to the 40s. Um, the, the Minnesota wild strain, I would say, was relatively successful. And some, they're not even stocking anymore, but some they've gone back in a few different rounds and put them in. Um, I think, sadly, it's kind of a world we live in with a very variable, um, you know, rain events and flooding events that can honestly wipe out entire year classes, even our naturally reproducing trout. So, hi. So I was just wondering, um, you do a chemo, I see you do a, a temperature analysis. I take it that you do a, a, a total chemo analysis of the aims that you're going to consider restocking as part of the reason that you're going to restock them? We have not done that. That's a good idea. Um, not exactly sure the different variables you would collect or the length you would collect them. Um, yeah. That I'm, not, I'm not as familiar with that sort of sample collection, what that would entail. But it's a good idea. Maybe, you know, the, the PCA is very active in our area. They do a lot more of the water sampling, water collection, um, set up a lot of like our stage discharge relationships. So we know when it floods, you know, what the actual discharge is at stations. You know, it, Maybe we do a stream that they have a lot of that information on and see if, you know, something was different between that one and maybe one that is good and maybe one that isn't as good and see how they do. Yeah, and so, you know, some of these streams we're stocking, like, I think one of the streams we're putting 900 fish, 80, 80 900, like fit in a coffee can. Um, they produce, you know, the hatchery can produce millions of these. So, anybody else? Ooh. I'm just curious, maybe it's speculative, but what percentage of those fingerlings do you speculate reach adulthood? I'm not sure. I think it depends on the stream. Uh, depends on the if you get a big flood the month after you put them in. Yeah, I would envision it's. You no, know, we stock like brown trout fingerlings in the river. And funny story, I I used to bartend, and a guy I used to bartend with um, worked at the old barn resort near Preston, and I had just stocked some. Uh, brown trout fringlings with a co-worker through that reach and on Saturday when we were bartending he's like I got a crazy story for you yeah I was fishing on Friday evening and I caught this nine inch brown trout and it looked like it swallowed a golf ball so it's a golf course which yeah maybe it did swallow a golf ball so my buddy and I we had to cut it open it had 44 fringlings in it and I was like yeah those are the ones we stocked like just earlier that morning. This is a nine inch brown trout. What do you think a 14 inch brown trout would do? Right, 400. Um, 
you know, some of these, these brook trout waters, they're like the width of this table. No brown. Some of them have no brown trout in them. Maybe a few, you know, young a year adults that like that shallower, cooler, cooler water. They're just trying to get away from their bigger brother. Um, I think if they can, you know, naturalize, they have a good chance. But as we know, you know, to and or get washed downstream. So. Oh, that gets that gets expensive. If you gotta feed them, feed is the most expensive thing for the hatchery. Well, so we, yeah. So the picture, those pictures of the one I already showed, those have been stocked. They will need to, as we keep bringing mates and refreshing the genetics in the hatchery, they get rid of some of the old adults. So we are planning to stock with adults as well. Thank you. You just mentioned that the hatcheries had millions of the fingerlings and, you know, whatever the number is, whether it's 500,000 or 2 million, uh, but do you, do you stock all of the fingerlings every year? Do you totally empty the hatcheries and then? Nope. Some of those will be kept and raised to adults that would then so again, you just got to keep refreshing the brood stock, they call it. The adults that in the hatchery is what you're stripping the eggs and stripping the milk from. You can't just use the same ones over and over again. They they lose their um, abundance and then you want to keep refreshing, adding new genetics into that or you're just going to get this genetic bottleneck as well. So most of them are stock and when i'm saying you know the other hatcheries there's brown trout there's rainbows as well rainbows we typically um stock catchable size so some of them we are raising um to, for more of a put and take often like within cities and places where kids have access to fishing um so most we're getting away actually from our fingerling smaller stocking so we really don't stock very many brown trout fingerlings anymore. And I think the reason of the brook trout is kind of just see how they do um, before you spend too much more money on feed and other stuff, raising them. There's not as much we know about this new strain yet. Yeah. Thank you. If you didn't already mention where you got the heritage from, could you mention that again in terms of what streams? Yep. So Middle Creek, which is in the Zumro River watershed, and then East Indian. But again, those those historically um, were a wild transfer from Hemingway which is um, falls in the Pine Creek, Brush Creek watershed. So, so the East Indian are technically Brush Creek genetics. And then our plan is we have four in the South Fork River. I kind of forgot to make a slide about that. We've been disease testing Vesta, Girl Scout camp, Other two, I don't remember. But but those two are our prime. Oh, sweet bottom was another one. But all four have been coming back disease free, so we have pretty good options. We've been doing our disease testing in September, and I'm going to continue to that um, this year, so that hopefully come November we can we can do an egg take out of the South Fork watershed. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, the Hemingway Cool Ridge 
um, in order to disease test, you have to kill the adults or 30 mix. They want half, at least half, half adults. Um, Borage has been kind of blown to pieces enough times that we just want to leave it alone. It's been, we did a big research project through there. The fish have been poked and pit paid and um, Vesta has some really nice adults. Um, so knowing that if they get come back disease free and we need to go in there and do a one day collection, you need to have enough adults that are actually ready to spawn. You might go there and only like five, you're like, yes, we're going to do this. And you, the first five shooting out eggs everywhere. And then the next 20, there's nothing. So you need to have enough adults to make sure that when you're there, those days, enough of them are ready to go. Cause they, there can be, you know, they can spawn for a month and a half. Different, different adults will be spawning at different times. Those are usually rip roaring ready to go. We just gotta wait for the stubborn women. <laughs> hey, Melissa, I'm sorry to break in here like this, uh, but I noticed from the clock that it's uh, a little bit past eight o'clock. And I don't know if you're staying in the Twin Cities tonight or if you have to drive all the way down to Lanesboro. Uh, so if you are willing to stay and answer questions, that's great. Uh, if on the other hand, you need to you know, get out of here, uh, let us know. I would, I would say I'm good till, yeah, 8.30ish at the latest. Okay. Uh, do you mind if I ask just a couple of other Zoom questions, and then you can turn it back to all those folks at the at the Fat Pants who, uh, I understand there's something like 50 people there, which is great. Um, but uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask one or two Zoom questions. Yep. So this question is from Brent Porter. And he wants to know if the DNR uses volunteers to do stocking, or is it all DNR employees? Um, I don't know that we've ever used a volunteer. That sounds really fun. No. <laughs> um, it, it, it definitely could happen. My brain instantly goes to liability, probably can't ride in our stocking truck, but if you drove your own vehicle and it was a location that had good access, I don't see why not. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think you may have already sort of answered this question, but there are a couple of questions out there about the idea of stocking the Minnesota driftless strain into the Lake Superior tributaries and I'm wondering if you could, I don't know, what should I say, comment as far as you know on uh, whether that's been done, whether it's a wise thing to do. Uh, if you just comment on that idea. It has not been done that I know of, but um, we've, we've been the only ones that have actually stocked some of these adults just because we're nearby. So we get an email, hey, you got a spot for, 238 per trout and I say yep um it's a lot further obviously to go to Duluth to do that so they have not been stocked up there whether it's a good idea or not like I'm not sure I'm not familiar I've seen the list of their streams I can't exactly remember offhand um Desiree Hendrickson was the one that manages that area I'm sure she'd um share her ideas but I do not know what those specific sites look like or. Okay, thank you. And then one on. final question, which came from George Vanya, and that is a que th th this question, <laughs> it's a big question again. How do you, how do you design a stream to keep brown trout out? Yeah, we've, so we tried to do this. Um, you can't keep them out. Um, back, everybody probably remembers 2007 when I first started with the DNR. Prior to me starting was a giant flood and Cool Ridge head cut from the mouth up through the pasture and there was like a three, four foot drop. And in the midst of that, they were also planning this research project of looking at brown trout, brook trout interaction and 
brown cramped up in the headwaters because they're being outcompeted by brown trout down below? Or if you took all the browns out, would they move down or do they just prefer the really cold water? So we actually did a big study and I don't remember all the results. It's been published. I could send you um, some literature to read and fall asleep to, but basically to answer that question, we could not keep them out. Like we shocked them three different times that year. We'd remove all the brown, pit tag the brookies, all this, all this work went on and we'd go back the next year and after a flood, there'd be more brown trout back up in there. So you can't keep them out. I guess the idea for our habitat projects is instead of building, like our ultimate goal is stream stabilization um, as well as building habitat. I think what we just have to focus on is let's try to figure out what building habitat for brook trout means. And I think we've kind of connected some good people that have done the work in Wisconsin. You know, browns prefer overhead cover and they can tolerate like the faster, deeper water. Whereas brook trout design, you know, if you can envision like a bluff pool where it's like deep because it's like down to bed rock. It's not going anywhere. It's up against the bluff, but there's really like one big giant bluff rock in there, but there's no overhead, even overhead grasses, but it's more of a deep, slow moving pool. That seems to be like what the brook trout prefer. Um, the challenge is how do you maintain those in the, the kind of harsh environments we're dealt with? If you make too slow of a moving pool, it'll fill in with silt. And if you're gonna rely on floods, well, then you better stabilize the crap out of it or you're gonna, you know, it's gonna be a big blowout pool. So, you know, not a lot of overhead cover, still giving them deep water so they can avoid predators. You know, most most trout predators are aerial, including you guys. Um, you got herons, you got eagles, you got otters on the bank, so they want to be able to hide. And even if it's just getting into deeper water where they can avoid those predators is still important, especially for those big, juicy, yummy looking adults with bright red and white colored fins. <laughs> so, you know, that's again, if you guys have any idea, like, man, I fish a stream and there's always brook trout here. Like, what characteristics do you see? Um, you know, we're up for ideas and kind of trying some things. That is a really, really good question. And I I'm sorry, can you repeat, like the, can you repeat the question? Oh. Melissa, we didn't hear the question. He he basically asked um, water temperature scenario. Are we seeing, you know, warming or cooling? I would envision cooling. We have a ton of data that we're working on crunching. Um, and, you know, data when you're taking a point every 15 minutes for some 20, 30 years, that's it's pretty intense data crunching. And I'm not involved with that, thankfully. But... I think we'll know some of that here. So we do have what we call long long term monitoring sites where we collect trout population data every year, as well as water temperature. And in the last 10 years, we've been doing you no know, longer than that since like 2007. Uh, we've been doing habitat features as well. So we have a lot of trout population data. We see these fluctuations, adult, you know, young year go up. They go down, adults go up, they go down. What's causing that? Is it flooding? Is it habitat changes? Is it temperature? Um, and we think temperatures playing a role in some of maybe why we're seeing really good options right now. Like I mentioned, the spring flow has been increasing. And so I think that's why the, the, the data current Renters are kind of excited to look at that temperature to data and see if we can see if that's maybe one of the reasons that our trout are doing so well. Good question. All right, Melissa, thank you very much for coming out tonight.
All right, we're going to be back here on April 26th. Um, our president, Bob Luck, will be back in town. And I guess because he's back in town, he's got somebody arranged that's going to talk about Tenkara fishing. So I think it all came, his, it was his idea. So we will see you back here on the 26th. Remember those two dates coming up here in uh, first part of April on Eagle Creek. And thank you very much. Uh, safe travels on your way home tonight.